Oh, hey, what's up? Hey, Jonah, what's up? Oh, you're right, I am Jonah, because this is just a reenactment of a real set of events. Yes, this is a reenactment. How are you? Have you seen Poor Things yet? Oh, Poor Things? Oh, dude, it's so much better than Barbie. I love that Whoa. movie. Whoa, okay, back up. Did you just say Poor Things was better than Barbie? I mean, it's one of the best movies of the decade. I mean, okay, like, well, what makes you fucking say that? Well, I mean, basically everything, I think. I mean, geez, like, where do I get started, really? I, I mean, like, the cinematography, the production design, I mean, the quality of the story. I mean, Yorgos Lanthimos really knows about femininity, and this movie is a true yeah, depiction no, I, of that. Listen, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with that because I think that you're kind of conflating two ideas that aren't necessarily <laughs> What are you insane. talking about? Do you, did you even watch the fucking movie at all? Are you dumb as shit? Did your mom throw you from a balcony when you were a fucking baby? Are you so, are you so dense that you didn't realize the complicated nuance that is found within well, poor Well, I'm just things? saying that I think that there's more to Barbie than there is to poor things. I think that poor things is really just a lesser depiction of womanhood, and I don't know necessarily if that can be equated to true female identity. Barbie is such a boring depiction of feminism. I mean, right, no, like, I don't think you're hearing me correctly because I don't know if you're understanding what I'm trying to get across to you because poor things is it's, not a it's, depiction of it's, womanhood. It's, it's not even not like a real that. way despite, to like really was, show Despite like, the marketing. Oh, hey, yeah. Uh, are you, uh, are you guys uh, talking about uh, poor things? Yeah, no, we are. Oh, yeah. Uh, so much better than Barbie. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, more conflict should ensue from that comment. See? Poor things over Barbie, bro. Who is it's not this just guy? Me, Who the dog. fuck is I swear. this? I mean, you're Who is that? You're That's so not even a relevant this. piece you of don't information. Know what women want, he doesn't even okay? know what we're talking and just about. That. It's fine. Listen, no, 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 no. You have no idea what women want. I promise you, on everything I love, I can name five women right now, and they all would say that I know, I know what, what they women want. want. I've I always known what know women, women wanted want. for the no, whole entirety of my entire existence. I always know exactly what it is that women have ever wanted in their fucking life. Do you understand me? I know women. I love women. I am part women. Hello and welcome back to the internet's trendiest internet personality. That's me. My name is Alejandro and if you're new here, God help me. <laughs> Today I kind of want to get right into the video because as you probably saw the title, you are ready to be mad at me. What is YouTube if not rage bait? That's what I'm here to give you guys today. Nothing but the ragiest baited video that you could ever find on this app. Perhaps I'll even push this out to TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, social media platforms that my parents are on, my family is on. All of my exes and everybody that's ever known me in a negative connotation will all see this video because guess what? This is the number one video on YouTube right now. <laughs> So I want to talk about Poor Things and I want to talk about Barbie because I think that these two movies have quite an interesting correlation and we will get into that. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about what is this video and why. I want to get into today's topic because most of you came here wanting to learn more about women's sexual liberation and women's suffrage, all written by a man. So let's get into it. Heavy brown with the sound. Really, I want to look at the ways in which we observe women in cinema, especially as it relates to male writers and directors, because I feel like there are ways in which men kind of, I don't know, reveal themselves when it comes to their views on sexuality or women's autonomy when writing a female character. No, I'm not caping for women, nor am I trying to speak for anybody. I just want to make an observation, give a theory, and let you all yell at me on the internet. Just hear me out, okay? Poor Things is a very abstract approach in that it starts with this unalive woman whose brain is swapped out by that of the fetus she carries in her womb by none other than the Frankensteinian Willem Dafoe, becoming what could only be described really as a sexual deviant. I, 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 I don't know what else to call it. I don't know what else to call it. You tell me what to call it. We begin our story in Glasgow, essentially, where Bella is coming of age for the first time. I mean, she must be in her baby brain, like two, three, four years old. This is where we meet Rami Youssef's character for the first time. He is a university student that's studying under Dr. Godwin, essentially is tasked with researching Bella and watching her develop into a full-grown woman. Before that ever happens, Bella begins to discover herself, notably by discovering masturbation. Now, once Bella is finished, we see the characters around her begin to kind of reframe 
what they believe Bella to be. Naturally, Rami Youssef's character falls in love. They almost attempt to marry until she meets Mark Ruffalo's character, who is Duncan something. Duncan something. Truly, Duncan something. Duncan is a dope. He's a little bit of a silly billy, but one thing that he is, is horny. And you know who else is horny? Bella Baxter. This begins our hero's journey, if you will, that Bella Baxter takes on. Once Bella travels with Duncan to Lisbon, she's in the puppy dog stages of meeting Duncan, fully enthralled with his sexual nature, as well as this unique world that she found herself in now. Duncan is perplexed by her bizarre nature, right? Having no idea that she's a woman with a baby's brain. The more Bella interacts with other people, the more quote unquote enlightened she becomes, you know, this understanding of the world around her becomes much more clear and she becomes much more curious and Duncan becomes much more scared and much more insecure and this man that was so overly confident in the first act now becomes this insecure kind of freaking out worried about what she might do type of person where he wants to bottle her up she meets with these two characters and they essentially talk about this polite society in a way that's very brash this very nihilistic view of, of the world where bella originally had no concept of nihilism now she's very curious about this reality that she might be in in paris ella has the ingenious accidental idea when she's looking for a hotel to stay in stumbles upon a brothel and within the brothel is convinced that if she has enough sex she'll make enough money to feed her and Duncan. So naturally, with her sexual curiosity at an all-time high, decides to fuck for money. Bella naturally has no real concept of what these gender roles are, so she couldn't care less and decides to continue working at the brothel to make some additional money but to also have more sex as she goes on this new adventure of sexual liberation duncan kind of falls into insanity and obsession where he wants to control her but has no ability to he's obsessing over every little person that she might have interacted with now i will say that this movie does a really great job at the absurdity and absurdism the satirical elements of this film are not lost on me by any means. Yorgos Lanthimos does a great job at immersing you within a world, within a story, and characters that are new and, and visually appealing. It, it's all it's all there. Like this is a technically masterful film. But as you can tell from the title of this video, I clearly have some particular opinions, if you will. I think my ultimate issue with Poor Things is that if this movie is trying to describe a female's journey through womanhood, it's not doing that. Now, you could argue it's trying to do the sexual liberation thing, but I would also argue to you that it's definitely trying to do the womanhood thing too, because it's clearly curious about the female identity throughout this story. And these aspects of her interest in surgery, to socialism, to general empathy for humanity, I think that those are inclinations that this story is trending towards trying to create a complete character identity versus just a sexually liberated deviant. And I'm using deviant very loosely. I don't mean it derogatorily. I'm just using it as like a descriptor, not a slur. The point being that these moments of nuance fleshing out a entire identity of Bella Baxter aren't these grandiose moments. I'm not asking for your ghost Lanthimos to do a 10 minute scene of Bella reading books and learning that, hey, maybe oppression is bad. Like, that's not what I'm trying to get at here. I think the devil is in the details within these things. Here's a scenario for you. You have a baby's brain put into a grown woman's body having to rediscover herself. Do you think that at any point she would menstruate within this story? Do you think that that would have some sort of perhaps conflict with the two male scientists who probably don't have an idea as to why women bleed in this particular region of their body. 
And I'm not necessarily saying that this is the only way to depict a full female identity. It's, it's more so these details of things that I don't think men really consider when writing female characters that like there are more parts to women. There are more things that happen to women that aren't necessarily sexually related that still feel degrading or still feel like discovery even. Trying to understand yourself, trying to recontextualize who you are within the, the given circumstances that you're, you're in. It could even be found in something as simple as like, you know, body hair, things like that. And these are very small, inconsequential things, right? But again, we're talking about the devil and the details here. Like Bella still always feels very pure, regardless of whatever situation she might be in. And I do think that that kind of gives way to this idea that like this movie is totally about women's, you know, identity or womanhood or liberation, things like that. Because ultimately, your ghost does not make Bella quote unquote ugly. My dad, every time we would watch like movies that were like female driven action films, right? He'd be like, you know, why doesn't she get a scratch on herself? Why doesn't she have a scratch on her body? Why is it that her clothes are only ripped? Like, yeah, it's cool that she's like doing these things, but at the same time, there's no chink in her armor. There's no imperfections. And I think that those imperfections can better contextualize the, the world in which poor things is, is created. <clears throat> Hello. Ran out of storage last night while filming at three in the morning, so we're back today to finish this topic. But the point that I wanna wrap up with Poor Things on is what is this movie trying to tell us? Genuinely, I think that in a lot of ways this movie wants to be a story of womanhood and coming into your own identity And yet I do think that it falls short in trying to get that point across Mainly because it lacks any sort of exterior substance that is unrelated to her sexual liberation And I think that sexual liberation is a great way to express identity But I do think that it's not the only way in which you you can tell a woman's story. There are moments where we do see Bella doing other extracurricular activities, but these things are so minimized and almost inconsequential that like they feel almost irrelevant to the main identity of this story. And I wonder what it is that Yorgos wants to get across with this film. When researching this video, I came across this guy's review and he had talked about this movie being a knock to Belle du Jour by Louis Baraniel. And I think the irony to me when he describes that movie, when he describes when this, uh, when this listen, film reviewer listen, listen, describes listen. poor listen, things being listen, a listen, listen, listen. heightened version of Fuck what he's talking about, okay? Here's the point about Belle du Jour that Poor Things fundamentally misses. And it's that there is a social ecology surrounding that whole movie in the time that it was created, 1967. In this time specifically, you have women in society who are fundamentally looked at as lesser or even second-class citizens. And so to have this movie that is about male's possession and obsession over women's autonomy, this movie speaks directly to the people that would be watching it in that theater. So when I look at poor things and I look at it within the context of our current zeitgeist in 2024, the year of our Lord, it's a little bizarre in some capacities, not in the good way though. I understand that this is absurdism, it's satire, it's not supposed to be taken seriously, but part of me wants this movie to be something more than it is. And that's because it's telling me with the story, with the complicated characters, that it wants to be a larger piece, but by only relegating these moments to sexual liberation and identity, when in the book itself, there are more aspects of Bella Baxter's character, especially when we're looking at the social and political sphere in which she tries to inhibit when realizing that, hey, poor people shouldn't be poor. I think that's a very understandable and very relatable moment in the story where Bella is trying to change the society that she now finds herself in. I think that matters to just the human journey, right? 
And I'm not necessarily arguing that this needs to be a large portion of poor things, but it does put poor things in only a particular box that fundamentally this movie becomes more of a performance, a performative piece, if you will, than really anything else beyond the fantastic cinematography and wonderful production design, which were rightfully awarded Oscars, this movie doesn't really go beyond the scope in which Yorgo sees, which is inherently the sexual identity of Bella Baxter. And it makes you wonder, right? Like what about that fascinated Yorgos Lanthimos? And I'm not trying to put something on his jacket that isn't necessarily there. He seems like a good guy. So it's unfair to say that this was a movie that was nefariously made, and I'm not trying to insinuate that. But I do think that there are aspects of this story that don't go beyond the male gaze. And I don't think that he intended for that to be the case, but I think that's just the reality that this story kind of lives in. And to me, it's only as good as that gets. The identity and the hilarity, the parody of the male gaze is only as far as the story really goes. That moment where Mark Ruffalo's character is just broken down after learning Bella Baxter started whoring herself for money is really a funny scene. I mean, I think it's, you know, hysterical, this idea that like he has no idea who this woman is and is trying to control her in a way that just doesn't work. No matter what, his life just seems to be doing worse the longer he stays with her. I think that that is a fantastic way of conveying it. But I do think that that moment also has this shroud of like, we're only gonna ever see Bella Baxter as this object within the story. And I'm like, dude, it's fine. I think the whole movie is essentially trying to convince you that Bella Baxter and women are human beings deserving of their own autonomy who have complicated relationships with the men in their lives. I think that that's pretty much all that movie is trying to tell us. But I wonder like, wh who is that message for, right? I don't think women are coming out of poor things and understanding themselves or understanding their place in society better. And when I read the book by the original author, it clearly is comparing the identity of personhood, especially as it relates to women, with the political environment that was created within the Scottish socialist uprising. And yes, while that becomes a more political idea, that story has more purpose because it's trying to conflate two ideas that do have relevance to each other. If I'm just taking a third of the story and putting it on screen and I'm trying to make a universal film, what is universal about this film? You just took a portion of it to create something that is, yes, a absurdist, surrealist experience, but what else is it? Cool, yeah, I like visuals, I like pretty pictures, I like pretty design, I like good acting. What is he trying to tell us? Okay guys, I'm making a leap in logic here, all right? Now, I just wanna be clear about this. I'm, I'm making a logical leap, so I want you guys to understand that I'm logically leaping, right? So metaphorically speaking, we're gonna go like this, okay? Okay? Okay, so, you know, you see, as you can see, I didn't really go that far. That's because I'm not really making a large logical leap. I'm just kind of, putting two ideas together. Okay, thank you. I want to assume that when men are trying to tell stories about women, they often exclude the parts about women that make them fundamentally speak to the identity of womanhood. And so this film, I think, falls within that category while trying to make a satire or parody about that repression. This is not an argument to necessarily say that men can't write strong female leads because Hayao Miyazaki exists. We have Princess Mononoke, Spirited Away, among other movies where he has female-driven stories. And to take this away from children's movies, we also have Joaquim Trier, I think that's his name, who made the worst person in the world. And this movie follows Julie, who is going through what could only be described as like a quarter life crisis, trying to navigate who she is, what she wants to be, and the relationship she'll keep along the way. I, I think that this movie tells a complete narrative about a woman in a genuine identity crisis without having to relegate her just to the sexual identity that she has. While these are parts or driving forces within that story, fundamentally, the character of Julie is trying to be herself. She's trying to find out who she is. I just think that when men are trying to make movies about women coming into womanhood, I think that it takes more than just their sexual identity to tell a complete story. And 
while Yorgos Lanthimos is trying to do that, I don't think he goes far enough to tell a complete narrative about that. So it makes me wonder why or what is this movie even about? Which leads me to this dialogue that has been coming up about Poor Things versus Barbie, where Barbie is written by a woman, produced by women, with a co-writer in Noah Baumbach, who is a man, but is one of the best writers in the fucking business right now. These people came together to create a story about self-acceptance, self-actualization, the pursuit of your own identity as it relates to being a woman. While this movie is inherently a corporate entity, I mean, created by a billion dollar toy company, I think that Barbie clearly is speaking to the generation that is growing up right now. And while some people can come into that movie and say, well, oh, I don't think that it does enough for women or it's too cheesy or Ken is in the movie too much, I think you're missing the point of what they're trying to get across because ultimately this movie is trying to speak to generations of women and generations of people that probably haven't been exposed to these types of ideas at such a large scale. I, I don't know what the last large blockbuster feminist movie was. Can anybody fucking name that for me? I don't know what that is. So not only does this movie speak directly to its audience, it's also trying to get you to take away something from it. And I think that's the important piece is that at no point in Barbie do you not understand what they are talking about. And that is by design because ultimately this is a complicated topic and it takes more than just one story of sexual liberation to tell this identity of womanhood. And so to me, it's hard to say that Poor Things is inherently better than Barbie because Barbie is trying to speak to the people that are watching it, and Poor Things is trying to perform for the camera. Barbie is a movie about Margot Robbie's Barbie who is living each day like it's the last. It's perfect, there's nothing wrong, no consequences, no conflict, everybody's happy, everything is good until she has an existential crisis. And that really sets her along this journey of trying to find out what is she made for, what is her purpose within this world, leading her on a path to go to the real world where she meets her quote unquote owner, who is also kind of dealing with the same identity crisis. When I was talking to people about Barbie, somebody had told me that it was an intro to feminism. I think that is probably the best way to describe the Barbie movie, considering that it really is trying to take you along this journey in a way that is effective, simple, and entertaining. Once all the smoke died down from like the ultra right-wing conservatives crying about women making movies, there was a real dialogue about the amount of screen time Ken got or the fact that the Oscars celebrated Ken versus celebrating the Barbie doll that this movie was based off of. I think those are fair conversations to have because ultimately we are missing, okay, I'm not the person that should be saying that. In some respects, yes, the culture did miss the mark on what Barbie was trying to talk about. I don't think that the audience this movie was meant for missed that mark. I think a certain demographic of people missed that mark. And yes, there are bits of this movie that do feel corny or cheesy, whatever you wanna call that. But you have to remember at the same time, it's a fucking kids movie, guys. I'm not trying to say that as a way of this movie being able to avoid criticism. I'm simply saying that they are trying to speak to the people. They are trying to tell you something. That's why it comes across a particular way. It's the same thing with which I had a personal problem with Black Klansman's ending when it had the Charlottesville riots playing at the end of it because I personally felt as though the whole movie was talking specifically about Charleston the whole time. And so I was feeling as though I could make that connection, but not everybody else makes that connection. So to say that Spike Lee shouldn't have included that Charleston footage at the end is selfish of me because ultimately he's trying to speak to the audience that hasn't made that conclusion. And so those people, when you see that scene, you are gonna recognize the similarities. You are gonna go, wow, like this is the same as before. That moment, you want to have within the film, within the cinema, while you're in the theater. That's the same case with Barbie, right? These moments have to be clear, they have to be strong, and they have to be a punch. Because if you're not making the equation now, you won't ever at all. So that is by design, and that matters in the case of Barbie specifically. To compare Barbie to Poor Things once again, 
I think that Barbie is trying to convey a clear message of personhood and, and women's liberation in a way that completely involves women. And ultimately, that is why the movie, in my opinion, is a better film. Yorgos wants to make a universal story, but it's not a universal story. I can see the Belle de Jour comparison, but once again, Belle de Jour was baked into an era in which women's liberation was essentially at the back end of every conversation, if in a conversation at all. That's why that movie is important. That's why that movie was big at the time. That's why that movie has impact and relevance to today because it began something for people, a realization, a type of aha moment. Whereas nobody is coming away from poor things thinking, wow, I you know, love to respect women now. I think women should be respected. Like, not at all. No, nobody's saying that, right? It's funny, it's cute. It's satirical, it's a little weird, it's very bizarre, but it has no, I respectfully would love to hear people's opinions on that. I don't necessarily think that this is out of left field. I think if you watch Poor Things, if you get something different, please let me know. I'm not seeing what people are seeing, dead ass. I don't know what y'all seeing in this fucking movie. Emma Stone certainly is a phenomenal actress. She absolutely, deserves to be nominated for the Oscar. I think that it deserved to win production design to some degree, but I also think that Barbie should have won things, right? I also think that a lot of movies should have won things, but that doesn't really happen. So regardless, I think this is where I'm gonna end today's video. It's already kind of a doozy for me. I've been editing this for days now. I'm ready to call it quits. If you guys have any disagreements though, please leave it in the comments because I'm ready to go to war this time. I got my phone, I got my notifications on. I'm ready to go back and forth, man, because here's the thing. You're wrong and I'm right. Is that how I'm gonna really end it? No, it's not. Got one more thing for you. Please be sure to like and subscribe. Let me know what you think about these videos, but also touch grass. Go enjoy the sun, it's spring. It's a nice day. Read a book maybe. Play some video games. I just started playing Fortnite again. Very addicted. Go enjoy yourself. Have some fun. Make some you time. Maybe this was you time. Make sure those bowels are cleansed, everybody. Go check yourself out. Go to the doctor. Go to the dentist. And I'll see you next time.